Today we're doing a video that we probably should have done a long time ago. Yeah? Yeah, I was a combat medic in the Army for 20 years, and so today we're going to tell you all about the first aid kit that we carry with us, which is a little bit more advanced than most people probably <laughs> carry with them. I wouldn't say that these items are easy to use. Okay. <laughs> for the layperson, but they're not, they're not <laughs> difficult to use, and if you know what you're doing, you can actually save someone's life. So I'm gonna show you the most important pieces of equipment that you can have in your first aid kit that could save someone else's life or could even save your own life. I get to be your patient? Yeah. So Leslie is gonna be my casualty today. Yes. You will see some angles perspective from the casualty's point of view uh -huh. and from the provider's point of view. Okay. And I will take you through step by step and show you exactly how to use all this equipment try not to get intimidated it seems a little bit intimidating at first because all this equipment kind of seems like well this is like for medical professionals yeah and, and and i could see where that would come off like how is this going to benefit me all? but believe it or not just us in everyday driving not during a tow day or anything we have come across so many accidents before medical people are on site. Yes. And you've had to go assist. And we've been at a function where people went down and you left to go assist. Yeah. And it just so happens in our world a lot. Yeah. And we wonder how much it happens in other people's worlds and they can't help because they don't know what to do. And not only that, I mean, there's always stuff going on at the campground. People are trying to fix their RV, get on their roof to do repairs yeah. or cleaning. They could fall off, they could injure themselves, they could hurt themselves, cut themselves. Mm -hmm. And so these things are gonna help you to help others Yeah. or yourself. Everything I'm about to show you, you can order on Amazon. This is not special order stuff. You don't have to get this from a hospital or a medical supply company or anything like that. And the company that I like to go, go with is Rhino Rescue. And I got the complete kit, which you can order all in one. It comes with all of the special stuff that you need that I think is the most important stuff. And I will take you step by step on what all is in this, even though I'm not going to go over each item and how it works. I'm only going to go over the most important stuff because other than the rest of this stuff is like accessories and tape and gauze and stuff like that. And that Rhino Rescue Kit is gonna come with these three pieces of very important equipment. And the first one is a tourniquet. The second one is a pressure dressing. And the third one is a vented chest seal. And I'm gonna show you how each one of these pieces of equipment works, but let me tell you what else comes in the kit. I'm not gonna go through all of this stuff, but it also comes with a nasal airway with some lubricant to create an airway through the nose. It comes with uh, compression gauze, it comes with an elastic bandage, some combat tape, and a pair of gloves. Now, in my kit, I always carry an extra pair of gloves because as you're going through the scene, if you're moving from, especially if there's more than one casualty or victim, one set of gloves ain't gonna cut it. You need to change those gloves, get into a new set of gloves before you move on to the next patient. It also comes with a pair of scissors. This is in case you have to expose the wound. And it also comes with this very handy case where you can keep all your stuff in there. The one piece of equipment that doesn't come in the Rhino Rescue Kit is a pocket mask. And when you're talking about medical emergencies or situations, you always want to go and order ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. So the most important thing is to make sure that your patient is still breathing. So a pocket mask is the most important piece of your first aid kit. And you can order these separately on Amazon. I'll leave links to all this stuff down in the description if you wanna go order it. And let me show you this mask and, um, and how it works. The pocket mask set that I ordered comes with an adult mask and a pediatric mask. Leslie is obviously an adult, mm -hmm. sometimes. <laughs> it also comes with a one-way valve. And I'll show you how that works too. First thing you do is you're gonna pop your mask open and then you're gonna put in your one-way valve. And this one-way valve is gonna allow air to go from your mouth into theirs, but it won't allow anything to come back up. So they can't breathe back through this thing. They can't vomit, sputum, blood, cough, hack, anything up back into your mouth. When you are going to breathe for someone via this mask, the best way to create a seal is what's called the EC method. So the reason it's called EC method is because of the shape of your hand. The bottom three fingers of your hand will form the shape of an E and the top two fingers or your index finger and your thumb will form the shape of a C. And you'll hold the mask over the top of the valve with the C shape and then you will cup your E shaped fingers on the 
bridge of the jawbone to allow you to do the head tilt chin lift as you keep the mask in place. Thank you to the sponsor of today's video, RV Mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. One of the first things you're always gonna wanna do when you get your new RV is change out the mattress. Absolutely. Because the mattresses that come in these things, <laughs> it's like sleeping on plywood, yes. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Aurora Lux yes. in the soft, oh, yeah. in the RV King, <laughs> and it regulates our body temperature. It has like science going on in there that keeps yes. you at a perfect 88 degree sleeping temperature. But if that's not for you, they have a bunch of different styles, a bunch of different firmnesses, yes. and they're custom made for RVs. Yes. So they will fit in RVs, exactly. unlike some regular mattresses that you'll find in the store. They also come with a 120 night sleep trial, a 10 year warranty, and free shipping directly from the factory in Arizona. They don't just have mattresses. No. They have accessories. I love accessories. We have the pillows, the sheets. Um, our daughter has one of their weighted, weighted blankets. blankets. They yeah. also have mattress protectors and all kinds of other accessories. Hey, check this out. This is the most coolest part. We can save you 25% mm -hmm. on your next RV mattress with RV Mattress by Brooklyn Bedding. All you gotta do is pop over to the link in the description of the video and use the promo code WAGS and save 25% at checkout. The next piece of equipment that I'm gonna talk about is the combat tourniquet. When this is packaged, it is cellophane up and wrapped up and it's put in your Rhino rescue kit. Take this out of the cellophane, open it up, and close it back up into a loop like this. The reason that you're going to do this is because in the event you have to put this on yourself and you only have one arm to do it, you don't want to be trying to open a cellophane and getting this in the right position to put a tourniquet on yourself with only one arm while you're bleeding to death. The other tip is these tourniquets only go on extremities. If you're bleeding in your head, you definitely don't want to put this on your neck. You will have a negative outcome. There's a common misconception that tourniquets are only used for amputations and that's just simply not true. This could be used to stop bleeding of any kind on any extremity and you only have to tighten it to the point where the bleeding stops. You don't have to cut off the circulation completely. We are gonna use this leg for Leslie as a casualty. You wanna make sure that in the event that this is uh, an amputation or a severe injury you want to go at least a couple inches above the injury you don't want to put the tourniquet on top of the injury at all uh, especially if you have like uh, an open fracture or you have some kind of bone sticking out so in this case we are going to pretend that leslie was in a catastrophic accident and her leg has been amputated from the knee down now i already have my tourniquet in a circle and she would only have a little nub here, so I wouldn't have to run this over her whole leg, just over, over the little nub there. But what I'm gonna do is, I will get that about two inches above the, the wound. I will undo my Velcro, and now I'm gonna cinch this down as tight as I can get it, and then re-Velcro it on the back side. I'm gonna take this little stick, which has some fabric that runs through the mechanism, and I'm gonna twist this. And I'm gonna keep twisting this, and twisting this, and twisting this, until the bleeding stops. So in this case, she's amputated from the knee down. There's blood probably squirting out of her stump. I'm gonna keep twisting this until it stops, and then I'm just gonna hook it in. There's a little hook right there to make sure that it doesn't keep spinning or unspin. And to make sure that it doesn't come unhooked, there's a little piece of Velcro that they give you to go over the hook to make sure that that stick doesn't come back out. When first responders get on the scene, you want to make sure that you tell them that you have applied a tourniquet to a casualty, and you wanna make sure that you have annotated what time that tourniquet went off. They are gonna relay this information to the hospital team so that they know exactly how long this extremity has been without circulation. The Rhino Combat Kit does come with a little Sharpie, and you can see on here on the tourniquet, on the little white spot, it says time and you just write in the time that you put on the tourniquet. You can take your gauze and some of the other sterile dressings that you have in your kit to bandage up the open wound part of the wound after you have stopped the bleeding. Don't try to bandage that first because you're not getting anything done. All it's gonna do is absorb all that blood and they're just gonna keep bleeding. Stop the bleeding first, then uh, dress the wound. Once you apply a tourniquet in the field, and when I say in the field, I mean wherever the incident happened before first responders get there, you will never 
never remove a tourniquet on your own. The reason that you don't use a tourniquet below the knee or below the elbow is because there are two bones in the lower leg and two bones in the lower arm and all that tourniquet is going to do is going to push those bones together and break them and it's not going to stop the bleeding because the arteries don't run next to the bones below the knee and below the elbow the arteries run right next to the long bones which is the femur and the humerus the next piece of equipment that we're going to use is a pressure dressing and this is going to be also used to stop the bleeding in the event you don't have a tourniquet or if this is in a position to where a tourniquet is not able to be used you can still use this pressure dressing you can either if it's in a place where you can't wrap it around the extremity you can just take it out put the sterile side against the patient and just push as much pressure as you can to stop the bleeding or if you have enough room to work with you can actually wrap it around i'm going to show you exactly how to do that we are going to simulate that Leslie's leg right here has been wounded again. And I've taken my pressure dressing out. You'll see it has a, an end right here that has the, the sterile part of the bandage. And then it has this really, really long tail, which is sometimes difficult to work with. But um, you can also use the casualty if they are conscious and awake and can help you, they can assist you in putting this bandage on also. So the wound is right here. I'm gonna take the sterile part without touching it myself and make sure I'm wearing gloves and I put that right on the wound. There's a little plastic mechanism. You wanna make sure that is right upright and right over the top of where the wound is. Once you come in that first go round, you're gonna go inside the plastic mechanism and then you're gonna go back across yourself and that is what's gonna create the pressure. And then you'll just keep wrapping this up all the way around until you get to the other end. At the other end, there's another plastic mechanism. When you get to the end, that secures onto the bandage like that. There is um, one instance in where you don't use a pressure dressing and that is if there is a suspected fracture um, or an open fracture. If you had a bone sticking out of the leg, you don't want to compress a bunch of pressure on that wound. Uh, it's all it's gonna do is press that bone back down into the wound and cause more injury to the patient. There is one other instance where you will not use this pressure dressing and that is if there is something that is impaled into the casualty. If there's something impaled in the casualty, first of all, never ever remove it because it could be stopping the blood flow and if you pull that out, it could cause them to actually bleed to death. And um, you don't want to put any pressure on an item that's been impaled either. And this would just put more pressure on it and cause further injury. You would just take the rest of your like, gauze or other dressings that you have and kind of dress the best you can around the impalement and stop the bleeding as much as you can without moving that casualty around too much. Uh, you want to keep that item stable because they're going to have to go to the operating room and get that removed to make sure that they're not going to sever an artery or something like that. The last piece of equipment we're going to talk about is the chest seal. Now this is used for someone who has a puncture wound in their chest which is probably going to cause them to have a pneumothorax. A pneumothorax is when you have a, a breach in your chest cavity it allows air into your chest cavity pushes the lung away from the wall of the chest and collapses the lung and then you have a bunch of air in there that's pushing on the lung that won't allow it to reinflate what this chest seal is going to allow is going to allow air to come back out of the chest cavity but not back in because it has a one-way valve attached to it this is a little bit more complicated for females because of the boobies. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your shears that came with your set and you are going to expose the chest area. So you're gonna cut any clothing off that you can so that you can expose it and you can see where the chest wound is. Now, if there are multiple chest wounds, you're gonna treat the largest chest wound first and then treat other ones after that. There can be more than one. Your kit only comes with one of these, but you can buy extras if you want. I always keep a few extras just in case. Um, make sure that it is exposed and make sure the area is dry. So there's going to be blood, there's going to be sweat, there's going to be other kinds of stuff going on. If you don't have a clean dry area, this is not going to stick to it and it's not going to work properly. So what you want to do is you want to prep this first probably and get this ready to go. That's how I did it when I was in combat because you wipe it off and guess what? More blood keeps coming out and all over the place. So what you got to do is you got to get this ready in one hand. You swipe the blood off and then slap it on <laughs> real quick before the blood can gush back out. Now, I will warn you ahead of time, this is extraordinarily sticky. It is very gooey. This stuff will, will 
not come off for days. That's why I'm not gonna actually stick it to Leslie's chest or to her clothing. But what I would do is let's just simulate that she has a, a chest wound right here. And you're gonna probably hear some gurgling. You might even see some bubbling coming out of here. They're gonna be really hard pressed to breathe. They're gonna be really struggling. So you'll be able to tell right away whether you have that situation going on or not. It has a little bit of gauze in here that you can use to wipe off the, the wound. Uh, or you can use that to put on the wound and put this over it. But again, I would take a take the clothing that you've cut off of them, take a piece of your own clothing. If you have a towel with you or something like that, you find that hole, you take this adhesive backing off, wipe off the chest and slap it on. Now this is gonna stick immediately. And what it's gonna do is it has three little valves. It's gonna allow air to escape out of the, out of the chest cavity but it's not gonna allow air to come back in through that hole because you've plugged it up. What that's gonna do is it's going to allow that lung to reinflate and press back up against the wall of the chest and it's gonna allow them to breathe better. Once you have this chest seal in place, you're gonna roll the casualty onto their injured side. You want their injured side to be down by the ground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take Leslie, I'm gonna roll her this way onto her injured side. I will take this leg and I will put it over like this way to prop her up, to keep her like that. And then I can take like a roll of towels or I can put something back here to keep her from rolling back that way. Now you might be asking yourself, self, why would I roll this person on their injured side? That side is already injured. Why am I trying to make it worse? You're not trying to make it worse. You have two lungs. We know that this lung is the good lung because it wasn't hit. This lung is already jacked up. One lung is plenty enough to get you enough oxygen to survive. If I were to roll her on her uninjured side, all this blood and air and all this stuff from this chest cavity is just gonna slide down onto that good side and now we're gonna collapse the other lung and now she can't breathe at all. So you sacrifice the bad lung, keep the one good lung functioning for as long as possible. It'll get them to the hospital where they'll have to get a chest tube. They'll reinflate that lung where it presses against the chest wall cavity and eventually it will heal and reattach itself to the chest wall. Well, there you have it. That's your basic save your life stuff. Our first aid kit and the mm -hmm. stuff that we use because normally the first aid kits you buy, you go to Camping World, you buy a first aid kit, it's going to have band-aids and it's going to have an alcohol swab and it's going to have some gauze and that's not going to do anything in a major issue. No, not in a major. If somebody has a major laceration or a chest wound or, you know, some severe bleeding, you need to be able to stop it. Yeah. And this is a very inexpensive kit. It doesn't cost a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty simple to use. How confident would you be using some of the stuff that I just talked about? <laughs> I don't do well with blood and guts to begin with, so I'm not very confident. <laughs> but I feel confident in assisting somebody with it. Yeah. I understand the usage. Yeah, and there's, there's way more to it than that. This is just the basics of make sure they're breathing, stop the bleeding, and usually by the time you get done with that, EMS will be on the site. Yeah. And they'll take over from there. So this is not like long-term stuff. There's other things you can do, treat for shock. You can elevate their feet, elevate their head, give them a little bit of water as long as they don't have an abdominal wound. Stuff like that is all, you know, basic stuff. But mostly it's just, you know, make sure they're breathing, stop the bleeding, and just calm them down, reassure them, because the more fired up that they are, yeah. the more times that their heart's gonna beat, and the more blood that they're gonna pump out of their body. Yes. Which is bad. Mm -hmm. You want all to keep all your blood in your body. <laughs> and uh, you know, I showed all this on Leslie's leg. The tourniquet and the pressure dressing can also be used on the arm, but make sure if you use the tourniquet, it goes on the long bone and not down here. Yeah. You don't want to be causing further injury. If you have any questions about this stuff, feel free to leave us a comment, ask us any questions. I'll be happy to answer it. I know I didn't cover everything. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to do something that I've never asked anyone to do on our channel before. And I'm gonna ask you to share this with somebody because this is the kind of information that can save someone's life. Yeah. And hey, stick around for a few seconds because we're gonna honor a fallen hero. If you wanna get involved with helping us help veterans while we're out on the road, everything you need to know is right down in the description of the video. Appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.